I am delighted to welcome my dear friend Abhilasha, who's uh, a Network Capital patron and a person who I consider um, a friend and advisor. And whenever I want to discuss strategy and philosophy, she comes to my mind off the late that she started writing uh, on, on, on LinkedIn and some of the other platforms. And I want to try and convince her to do that more. Abhilasha, welcome back. Thank you for being who you are and doing what you do. Uh, what are you up to these days? Very interesting time. So I am finally taking my first uh, break in my career, um, or rather first break whatsoever since I was 16. Um, I'm on a sabbatical, uh, which is uh, super interesting. Um, and, you know, I think I've been considering this for a while, for three, four years at least, but this just seemed like the perfect timing. And um, I think right now, you know, just sort of recapping uh, last year, I had been sort of, I'd been with this amazing better for you food brand called Open Secret. I'd been sort of building out a vertical marketplace, then ran sales and sales and growth for the last year. Um, and it's been phenomenal, right? The journey was like really looking at driving phenomenal growth along with profitability milestones. Uh, and honestly, for this was the first time I did sales in my life. I actually never thought I'd be doing sales. Um, and uh, I don't think I had anything to complain about my career or my um, sort of what my role. I think the big thing was I still hadn't found my ikigai or I still hadn't found something which I was super, super passionate about in, in the sense of like, this is this is the beautiful intersection. And I've been fortunate to have worked with like um, bosses, with colleagues, with people like you, like seeing them up close and personal who've really taken up the time to find what this ikigai looks like, you know, something they love doing, something that adds value to the world, uh, something that they can make money from. Um, so actually that's exactly what I've been doing. Um, so I started my sabbatical in March, so it's about month three right now. Um, mm. And it's been very interesting, you know, initially I had promised family that I would be doing zero work. Uh, hmm. but that's not been the case and no points for guessing. Um, I think initially, I think there are two or three different hypotheses that I've been exploring. Um, you know, I wanted to be, I have very myriad interests. Um, hmm. I love sort of, you know, the cutting edge of businesses, uh, especially tech businesses. I really like what is called people skills, you know, org building, um, sort of capacity building among people. Um, and then of course, you know, underlying cross-cutting all these things, I love uh, certain industries, right? Like, you know, certain things like whether it's healthcare, education, future of work, you know, all of these things. Um, so um, I actually was beginning of year was uh, sort of started training to get uh, licensed as a coach. Um, hmm. And um, I also, of course, you know, have worked in startups all my life. So right now, professionally, what I'm doing, uh, maybe seven, eight hours a week, is um, I work as a coach for um, a couple of CXOs in, you know, mm. high growth uh, entrepreneurial setups. Um, and then I sort of often also take on a consulting project. You know, hmm. maybe building out their financial system, building out their um, sort of people processes, uh, building out their sales funnel. So it's usually companies which have already done their zero to one and possibly their one to 10. Um, so they're either mm -hmm. in the one to 10 stage or 10 to 100 stage. So at an inflection point. And it's 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 phenomenal. Like, uh, I agree, I work 10 hours a week or seven to 10 hours a week, but I'm really enjoying it. And uh there really is a fairly limited template for this. I know a couple of my mentors who are doing similar things. I didn't even know about it when I started, but this model where you both work as the coach uh, for a C-suite member, as well as a consultant for the organization is uh, unusual because coaches are meant to be very open-ended, you know, help you find your own path. Um, consultants are supposed to be more prescriptive in nature where they bring in an expertise. Um, but you know, the way I like to summarize it is that um, I want to help a certain stage of companies solve their most pressing problems 
uh, mm -hmm. that's you know, these growth stage inflection companies. And I think like for better or for worse, I have both the IQ and EQ to support them. And that's the reason we try out this pretty interesting model, which I like to call like a uh, coach consultant. And just because I love alliterations, I add a comedian to it. Um, so it becomes <laughs> the coach uh, consultant comedian model. Um, because I also like to bring levity to the situation. I've seen a lot of stressful situations in my career. So I know it's right. important to step back and have levity just so that you have the energy to continue making the most of an inflection point. Um, so yeah, very early days. Um, this is what I'm currently exploring. Um, and of course, like I'm pursuing a lot of passions, right? Like writing, finally. Um, I'm doing a creative writing workshop next month, attending one. I am sort of traveling. I'm like pursuing a lot of latent interests. So it's it's fun times. Um, Wonderful. But... Let's, un let's unpack each of these uh, interests. But uh, you are a Harvard Business School graduate. Before that, yeah. you went to IIT Delhi. Um, so as you said, you have the IQ, EQ. Nobody will look at your resume and say that, uh, you know, what's missing? There's nothing missing. It's pretty perfect the way it is. But if you were hypothetically applying for HBS today and you yes. were in this particular situation, how would you tie your interests and how would you explain the current stage in which uh, you find yourself? And what sort of, what's the overarching end to this curiosity, if any? Yeah, no, it's a great question, right? So for me, I think um, there are two or three uh, themes that I toy together. One, let's start with the um, sort of macro and then we'll come down to the specific how it impacts the individual. So at a macro level, frankly, uh, I like working with companies at an inflection point. And um, the word inflection is deliberate because I think some of the uh, typical categorizations of like, you know, uh, X, X dollar revenue or like X stage funding, I think is a bit reductionist in nature because, you know, you could even have a Fortune 100 company with one of its verticals undergoing an, uh, sort of inflection. That's exactly what I also did at uh, when I did consulting um, in the US at Innersight, which is, you know, this amazing professor, Clayton Christensen's firm. It was very similar. It was companies at an inflection point. So it could be like, you mm. know, and right now I'm working with someone, uh, so with one of the agencies, which is so, uh, sorry, one company, which is an agency, which is a phenomenally profitable business now trying to get towards becoming um, its next stage of where it wants to go. There's another, which is like a venture funded company. There's one that's a social enterprise. I mean, these are all in different capacities, but um mm essentially inflection points right now so that's at the macro which is like i think inflection points um, are of interest to me because um, in a very short amount of time you could either bring a very great change to the trajectory or lose that opportunity right like inflection points whether it's in terms of your size your funding your like just the momentum there's a short span of time where you sort of can really change the trajectory uh, mm. one way or the other. And I'm very aware that it can also go downhill. Um, so that's one. Um, two, I fundamentally like uh, look at certain spaces that I think net net add value to the world. Mm. And, you know, again, my definition is very different from any purist. Um, but I think for me, value to the world is just uh, often like just creating impact on humans um, in a net positive mm -hmm. way. So their well-being, um, their sort of, um, which could be healthcare education, but also things like the power of stories, right? So it could also be a creative firm because they're just redefining how um, storytelling is done, right? So a lot of different things where you're creating value for individuals or businesses, typically just because you're approaching something with a new lens. Um, hmm. So that's macro, which is companies at an inflection point and within those companies that tend to um, be creating value in a way that fits my definition. Um, right. So that's one first theme that if I were applying to Harvard today, I would probably have called out. Um, the second is very much like uh, it's all about the people. 
right? Like I usually mm. do these uh, um, sort of things. Very fortunate to have lots of friends, mentors, peers who are now um, sort of running companies of their own, right? They're often CEOs themselves. They have the power and mandate um, to bring in somebody um, who can truly be a sounding board or like, you know, work with them as a partner. I'm not in a mm. platitudinal, this sounds good way, but people who are very open to getting that input, good, bad, or right. ugly, right? Want to sort of capitalize on the inflection point, are hmm. willing to do the discomfort, you know, are willing to go through the discomfort that's required for that. Um, and with whom I have a sort of good mutual trust relationship, right? Because hmm. these are uncomfortable things. Um, and I think the third thing is just like in terms of the nature of projects in work, um, it's very much like um, it's got three characteristics. It has to have high doses of EQ, which means like, mm. you know, working with individual leaders, uh, defining CXO relationships, um, or like working with someone who's sort of having a difficult time scaling up. Uh, it often involves the IQ. So it's a very intellectual piece of like, how do we build our sales funnel to go from founder led to a sort of, you know, um, a VP led model? How do we right. define our cap table? So very, very purely intellectual IQ things. Um, and I think the third characteristic, so these are all hypotheses right now, is that it has to happen in sprints. Uh, and what of I mean course. by that, I come in for say three, four months, uh, we finish something. Uh, and then I move out and uh, then we decide if we want to re-engage, if we have something meaningful to work on. Um, and the goal is I'm not here to give you, make you dependent on me. That's not my goal at all. Mm. Um, so that's kind of the nature of the work. So, you know, just in summary, it's like working with companies at inflection points uh, with, you know, where there is just this um, in areas that I think have value for the world. Number two right. is really coming in and working with organizations where the leader themselves uh, has this desire to sort of get to the next level and is willing to put the work mm -hmm. instead of like, you know, um, get that done. And the third is in terms of projects, it's very much like what appeals to my own side, which is IQ, EQ, um, and, you know, just as a sort of delivery model is done in sprints of uh, Mm, yeah, effort right and it's a question that that is asked uh, in many business school like harvard where are you going like what are you trying to go I, I don't know why they ask but everyone tries to know what are the future plans are there and i can only guess they want to see whether the student can or the candidate can reflect with uh, yeah. many unknown unknowns so if you know, as a as a graduate, if you were to, you know, assume that you're not one and you're applying, uh, where are you going? Where are these three very beautifully reflective intersectionalities go going towards? I think so. Um, and, you know, I think about my career and phases uh, and those phases can be anywhere between uh, one to three years, uh, actually one to five years in nature. Um, and there can be a whole different podcast on why I think one year is enough and why I think five years makes sense in certain cases. Mm. Uh, my current thesis really is I've really enjoyed, um, uh, from my own experience, I've really enjoyed uh, being a consultant and being an operator. I spent mm. like the majority of my career being an operator within companies starting right from the youngest person in the room to sort of rising to be a CX sort of pretty early, pretty young age. Um, and I also enjoy being a consultant because I felt the outside in perspective helped a lot. Um, mm. You know, some of my roles also had an outside in perspective, right? So I was chief of staff. I've been like the head of strategy and operations. So these were sort of cross-functional, um, slightly outside in roles, even when I was being an operator. Um, and honestly, for the next one, two, three years, I want to sort of operate at the intersection of inside and outside. Like I work mm. very closely with organizations, but I also have a certain distance um, to sort of deliver the maximum value in an environment mm. where there's a lot of ambiguity, there is change, there is an inflection point. Mm. 
And um, where am I going? I really think that as organizations will evolve, as the future of mm. working evolves, I think a couple of things are happening. One, in any organization, we need people who are entrenched to be able to step in. Similarly, we need people from the outside to come in and entrench themselves. So there's something happening at that intersection, uh, which we need to do better, codify and really get the best results out of it. That's number one. Number two is I really think the future of work is going to not be full-time employment uh, mm -hmm. in the traditional sense that we've had. Um, and I think it's going to be a lot more outcome-based sprints uh, people engaging in different modes, people pursuing interests that are very diverse. Um, I And so that for me from a personal level is um, sort of testing out that hypothesis because I'm convinced that's where the future of work is going. Um, or I think I'd rather say there are very good indicators. So I think it's more like working at the outside inside intersectionality for companies, which is how do you really come in and deliver the maximum value at that outside mm. inside intersection and number two as an individual I think the future of work is going to be very different um, you know this is just one part of I mean literally I'm in month three of my sabbatical so this is literally the only project I've like you know work I'm doing also intend to build a company I'm also investing so it's like you know you're building a portfolio of um, income streams work interests versus the more sort of siloed I am a product manager at X for Y years kind of thing. That's yeah. my thing. Um, and I think there's a third theme there, even if this is not necessarily the future of work, this is the this is what works best for me. I like that flexibility. I like the sort of dynamism. I like the eclectic nature. Um, so it's it's like a net net win for me. I am in my book, as you know, Abhilasha, Passion Economy and the Side Hustle yeah. Revolution. Essentially, I talk about the unbundling of work from employment and how we are moving towards not just uh, uh, people choosing to do low end jobs uh, at different uh, times and spaces, as was the norm in the past. But today, people with the highest credentials and the highest level of intellectual sophistication and moral sophistication are choosing this path. Interestingly, I met somebody very senior who used to work at Google and Facebook and um, now at another free IPO company. But now he makes it a point to work as a consultant wherever he goes yeah. for pretty, my, pretty much the reasons that you outlined. Yeah. Like he chooses to do sprints, which are focused on a particular outcome. Then yeah. he does that. Then he does another thing. So uh, I think this model definitely has a lot of strength and hats off for you to try. Are you doing a good job of really taking a sabbatical? You mentioned it a few times that you're on a sabbatical, yeah. you're working fewer hours. Uh, in in philosophy, one yeah. of the philosophers that we hosted on Network Capital, he says that the work today, even if you work for fewer hours, it tends to colonize your mind. Like you tend to think about it all the time. You're yeah. always trying to grow and a lot of this productivity porn, creativity porn is the norm, especially among ambitious people. Yeah. So because you reflect well, tell me if you're doing a good job or not. I think right now I'm doing a phenomenal job um, and okay. I'll explain how and why. I think what you said is like is 100% correct. Um, I think we've gotten to a point where we are mildly engaged with work almost all the time. Right. So your mind is still mm. there. You're very preoccupied, uh, both because of the nature of my work um, and also because of my own practice. Right. I have my own meditation practice. I have a spiritual practice. I am actually 100 percent present um, doing whatever I'm doing. Um, so if I'm sort of uh, just doing a quick check, Utkarsh, you can hear me, right? Yes, absolutely. Just for a few okay. seconds, I need to do it. Perfect. I'll just continue. Um, so when I'm sort of doing my work, I am, I do really deep work, right? Like I will put my phone away. I will sort of uh, literally no interruptions and in allowed. Uh, the only calls that come through on my mobile will be like from loved ones, select number. 
Um, and I do it in very time, even when I prep for my work, these are calendarized and very, very specifically carved out. Um, and that also means that I'm just 100% focused at that. Um, to be fair, the way I'm making sure I also have a sabbatical is that I'm also bringing the same rigor and ambition to just fun stuff. So, um, you know, on a weekly basis, I'll just check like, okay, how much did I read? Uh, did I get a chance to travel? Um, did I watch some really trash content, right? Like something just to uh, bring humor to the whole situation. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, I think um, initially it was difficult, right? Like, because it was like, hey, can I just, um, you know, um, it felt very unknown. It felt very um, sort of a bit scary as well, because it was so different from what I'd done in the past. Um, and then because I was finding work very interesting, uh, there's also, there was also the desire like, hey, I could be spending like 45, at least 20, 30 hours a week doing this uh, every week and enjoying it. Uh, but I think I've also made sure that I uh, find time for other passions and interests. It's good that I have many passions and interests. Uh, so that helps. Um, number two, I think I have... Right. Um, yeah, that really helps a lot. I think I have a very sort of strong um, meditation practice. So when I'm present somewhere, I'm 100% present. If I'm not going to be present, I literally will not do it. That includes watching mm. like right from this conversation uh, to watching a really lame movie in the theater. Like I will not do anything else when I'm doing that. I'm just doing that. Um, third, I think I've been lucky, you know, so I know my own feelings. I knew I was very capable of like, still like not taking time off so I have nudges baked into the system like I openly told like family friends that hey if you see me swing the other side too much where I'm not resting uh please call me out on it right so I knew I'm capable hmm. of doing that I sort of you know audit how I spend my time on a weekly basis I um have small sticky notes you know on my whiteboard laptop saying are you resting enough? Are you having enough fun? Right. Um, because I know my own feelings. So I would say right now, I would probably rate myself like a nine or nine and a half on 10 um, on truly making this a sabbatical and like balancing everything, um, you know, that I would be doing. That's phenomenal. The reason I'm asking you qu like deeper question than not so much about your early life and journey to business school is because that is in another podcast. Yes. And the listeners will uh, listen first to that and then to it. This one I want to make about projecting careers and thinking about careers in different phases and perhaps the philosophy of a, a relatable young professional who's done really well. So that's why my questions are a bit probing, perhaps a bit intrusive. So uh, feel I'm free to call it. me out if, if I'm going down that. Okay. Abhilasha, I have noticed a change in you. Um, yeah. I've known you now for six years. Yeah. And uh, you were reticent of sharing stories, uh, some tricky ones, some un uncomfortable ones yeah. uh, on a public platform in the yeah. initial uh, four years, I would say. And yeah. you're relatively more open now. Is, yeah. is, is that because you are more successful or you have even more badges of success now? Or what has changed and how are you how how do you think of these different stories um that you share with the world i know it's a great question um and i'm pretty intentional about it so i i do have an answer i i don't think it's because i've been more successful um if any um i often talk about i, I think success is a very i think everything is very um mixed you know, some of the hardest years of your life will give you the maximum learning, some of the most successful things on paper, maybe a crappy time for you, you know, in the space. So I, I don't think it's that. I think um, I think there are a couple of reasons that sort of uh, worked. Um, I'll start again with the more overall macro societal and then I'll come to individual. Um, I mean, macro societal, honestly, I was done with seeing pretty bad content <laughs> on uh, a lot of platforms I write mostly on LinkedIn uh, and I was like my god this is so bad and I mean bad in the sense like 
it's uh, it's very repetitive. It's very clickbaity. A lot of it, and I would say a lot of it in the sense, let's say, um, you know, um, 30, 40, 50 percent of the content I was seeing was stuff I didn't want to read. Um, you know, and I was just like, this is too clickbaity. This is just so uh, pretentious. Um, I have no problems. And you can put this in the final video. By the way, I, I one of the I don't know. We should say it. I do. I do want to say one network capital person. Uh, she's very witty. She works at McKinsey. She shared a story of uh, somebody who asked another person to marry that person and had shared B two B lessons that he gained through the process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or the cab driver insights that that yeah. happen, which are common these days. Yeah. Yeah, and it's almost like that's blatant plagiarism, right? Let's forget everything else. That's like unethical writing happening let me just put it it's not just bad writing because i don't think there's bad writing right you know it appeals to different people's tastes but there's just unethical stuff being put there um so that was one i was like this is really second i then found people whose writing i enjoyed and i was like you know what if i actually used my voice it might sound similar or at least it might mm. engage a certain audience it's different um so i'm a huge believer that if something starts annoying you a lot about something and you want to change it or you think you can change it, you should either change it or just stop getting annoyed by it. Um, that was yeah. kind of my relationship with LinkedIn. I was just like, this could mm -hmm. be a very interesting platform. Uh, you know, I have a history of thinking about mentorship, about learning from different sources uh, in a professional context. And I was like, you know, LinkedIn could be pretty powerful in a sort of diffuse learning environment setup. So I was like, well, either I can stop complaining about it or I can just uh, do something about, you know, do my small bit about it. So that was one. Um, two, like I said, I found writers um, um, and uh, whose writing I found very interesting. There was an authenticity in the voice. There was a sort of depth and nuance. Um, there was humor. Uh, and a lot of my own writing is like that. Um, so I think that was, uh, you know, sort of mm. uh, the, the macro motivator. Uh, number two, honestly, over the years, I had become more comfortable with writing. So, um, mm. so quick story, I've always been an orator, right? Like I just um, write since I was in school. I've been an orator first. Um, you mm. know, I prefer, that's my preferred mode of communication, or at least was my preferred mode of communication. Um and so, you know, that was it. And writing, honestly, is something I've had to work on. Um, so when I went to Harvard, it's a running joke. I didn't need to work with a writing coach. Just based on my mm -hmm. class participation and my, you know, analytical skills, I would have done well. But I was like, this is an amazing opportunity. Literally, no, very few people use this writing coach. So I show up every month to work with a writing coach. I also did a creative writing course a couple of years back you know, I'm doing a follow-up version of the same course next month. So I just came into my own with writing. Uh, you know, um, another network capital patron, um, Shruti, our mutual friend, when we were in undergrad together at IIT Delhi, she used to like break her head trying to get me to write one article for the student body <laughs> letter. And I was like, listen, if I, if I can just speak it out loud and someone can just like you know, transcribe it or whatever, that'll work, but I'm not going to write because I'm too lazy. So I think mm. in some ways, I sort of just came into my own with it. I also have been journaling for five, six years. So, you know, these three facets of like really working with a writing coach, uh, doing creative writing courses, um, journaling and just seeing the value of it just got me to the right point. Um, and number three, honestly, was uh, feedback. Um, so on it, I... I'm not writing for any sort of impressions or like click whatever of that kind of sort of thing. I actually find it a bit disconcerting if something garners too much visibility. I'm still a very private person. Um, thankfully, I haven't gone viral more than once or twice. And that itself was a bit disconcerting. Uh, but I got a lot of feedback from people saying, hey, you know, we really appreciated your openness about talking about uh, your mental health uh, you know mm. both people in a professional capacity as well as personal capacity so people building companies in the space people who had had their own set of challenges um, very young women would reach out and say it's really nice to have some you know have your to have your writing because it's very real inspiring and also just like a peek into the fact that you know I might my resume might look very like 
polished on paper, but there are many, many, many uh, chinks in my armor. Um, mm. So I think, and it, they, I'm stronger for them, right? I don't even think that. Um, so I think that was the main catalyst, uh, which is that I just felt like I didn't know I could make this positive difference in people's lives. Uh, and then when I realized I could, I was like, oh, wow, I enjoy doing it. Um, I think mm. I write about once or twice a week uh, and in general on LinkedIn. And uh, if it's having, you know, if it's making the platform slightly more full of content that I like as a reader and, uh, you know, if it's making a positive difference to someone's life, uh, I'm all for it. I will say it's not all rosy. Um, the more, and I don't even, like I said, I actually avoid looking at like impressions, followers. I ran marketing at my previous job. So I know how data driven you can be. Um, but the number of trolls are also increasing. Uh, I haven't had too many trolling. Really? Incidents. On LinkedIn? Oh yeah. I definitely had like one or two. And I have friends, um, you know, like... Uh, Ahana was the CEO of Open Secret and as a dear friend, and she has a huge reach on LinkedIn. And even through her, I can see, oh, wow, as my presence on the platform increases, there is going to be trolling. Um, mm. I mean, so it's not pleasant. I think my philosophy very much is you troll me once and I'm going to block you because I don't have the energy to sort of engage with trolls. Yeah. Um, yes. Constructive criticism, 100%, but you come and troll me I'm not going to give you that space. Um, so it's interesting. We'll see where it goes. Um, no, you must I, continue. I mean, I was just uh, uh, at, at, at another panel talking about the importance of ownership and yeah. high quality of content, high quality ideas uh, yeah. do deserve the leverage. And you know, you're such a clear thinker and such a you know, person who can reflect without being recursive. I don't mm -hmm. like people or schools of thought that just, you know, go keep saying, like, you know, just reflecting yeah, the, same. the image of a tortured philosopher sitting in a corner, very upset with life. <laughs> that is not good thinking. Yeah, It's about clear first principle thinking. And if it makes you happy or sad, that should not be the case. Yeah. Yeah, but I really want to get our listeners, especially our community members out of this mindset that being reflective and being tortured, like sitting in a corner, are the same thing. They have nothing to do with each other. Nothing. So uh, your reflections today have really uh, helped our listeners put their stories in perspective, both the ones that work and the ones that don't. So uh, when it comes to the work that you've done post-business school, yeah. how much of that has been a function of planning and how much of that has been uh, a function of uh, serendipity or something else? How did you decide to take up your jobs post MBA? What have you learned through them? What have been the upsides and downsides of these choices? A long question, but perhaps you can structure it the way you like. Sure. I, I, I'll sort of like begin with a, a cliche. There's, I don't know who said this, but someone says it that uh, the dots only connect when you look at them backwards. Um, so honestly, I couldn't have chosen a better set of a better path for myself uh, if I had planned it or a bit more intentional. Um, when I, because it's like, you know, it was just the right mix of um, sort of operator, consultant, or inside deeply entrenched in a function, cross-functional role, uh, geographies, mm -hmm. I worked very, very, split my time almost equally between uh, sort of U.S. facing or U.S. centered roles, uh, India facing and like Bharat facing roles, if you will. Um, so, um, and those are all my interests, right? Eventually it's a question of what are you trying to achieve from your career? So um, it makes, you know, a lot of interest. A lot of it is an emerging technology just or emerging trends. That's just, again, something that is a personal interest. Um, so um, I would say initially it was far more serendipity, right? Like, um, I often tell this story that when I was at business school, um, in my second year, I was like, I don't think I want to work at a large company. Uh, very few companies besides the large tech, like, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Google, sponsor visas. 
Um, the only ones that do are typically, you know, traditional strategy consulting. I didn't want to do strategy mm -hmm. consulting. I just applied to Innersight because it looked like a super interesting job description. Um, Innersight is, you know, it's like a sort of innovation consulting firm for, you know, founded by Clayton Christensen, who was an HPS professor, and he's done the most pioneering work on disruptive innovation, right? Like, what is disruptive innovation and how can you innovate um, with a method to the madness? Um, I loved everybody I met. Like, you know, some of my closest friends from my time in the States are former colleagues and bosses. Um, and, you know, we had a, so that time it was more instinct where I was like, oh, wow, this is just like, uh, this seems great. And they want to give me a visa, right? Or whatever, OPT, I don't know what it was. I don't even remember mm. the, <laughs> and so great and loved my time there. Um, then did US India. I worked for a startup which was uh, product and engineering elucidator, which was building an AI platform for drug discovery. A phenomenal company. Uh, they just got listed on Fast Company uh, as one of the most innovative biotech companies. Uh, it feels like a full circle because my first project with them, even before I started working, was to write a Fast Company application some <laughs> five, six years back. And we didn't even finish the application. Like, it was one of these. So today to see them as a fast company, innovative company, and to feel like I might have played a small role, um, uh, just, just phenomenal, right? Like it furthered my interest in biotech and healthcare. A lot of my work at Innocide had been in healthcare and digital wellness. Mm -hmm. uh, this was cutting edge biopharma. Like literally I had to read science papers. I had to really like, you know, our clients were scientists at like, Moderna, Pfizer, think about everyone who was involved in the COVID vaccine in the future. Um, did that for two, about two years, did the India-US thing, literally lived on two continents. Um, and then I think I, uh, after that, I had started becoming more intentional. So I at least had a thesis going in of what I wanted. Um, I don't mm. think other people fully registered what I was doing, but I assume that comes when you're like, intentionally or unintentionally building a category of one because there is no template right like you're just doing mm. something that makes sense to you um i had actually been out of the us for five out of india for five years between 2015 to 2020 which is when india had completely changed right there was upi there was like fast internet like i had no idea and so when I, after I was sort of decided to transition out of Elucidator because I was just tired of the India US life right. and COVID hit, which was just weird because my decision to leave had happened before COVID. So I anyways would not have been able to leave, you know, live that life. I was very intentional that I wanted to do a very, very India stint, which means like mm. um, a company. And I, I think I eventually joined Hike as the chief of staff to the CEO. Because Hike had been one of those companies that had gotten disrupted by all these mm. changes, right? Like with the sure. uh, fast internet, low cost mobile devices, as well as, uh, you know, your um, just like free internet, uh, the super app, uh, you know, which was their entire thesis going in, there was no longer in need. So this was a company right. which was a unicorn, which had to pivot at that scale and size, you know, um, and that's when it, you know, it met my desires of seeing a big part of a turnaround, being part of seeing a very India centric company. Um, and, uh, you know, so that was there. It was also chief of staff role. So I wanted to be cross functional again. And then finally, my last gig at um, Open Secret. I mean, one, it was just like, uh, my first CXO stint, which is uh, very interesting. Mm. I think I always thought I'm not a I don't really care about titles. Um, so I was like, I mean, I've been a VP, whatever. How does it matter? There is a difference. Um, you suddenly have more responsibility, ownership. Um, and like, just when shit hits the uh, you know fan, you're like far more responsible. Um, I first have spent the first year running product, which was both offline and online, because I wanted to now go functionally deeper. So right. I was hired to build out our vertical marketplace. So we were literally building a vertical marketplace for uh, better for you brands, because, you know, how does a consumer discover and like really have a health platform for that? 
Um, and you, we had a brilliant zero to one, right? I mean, 150 brands onboarded within like three months. We had a tech stack ready. Mm -hmm. We had a platform ready. Um, and we, I, I was also running our offline product portfolio. So we were launching one product per month uh, in completely different wow. spaces. We were doing like, uh, a, you know, a no mega an, um, brownie in one sort of month a baked bhujia next month. And this is really hard work. New product development. So were you contributing to these pretty interesting sounding things? Oh, yeah. Like that was my mandate. My, ma my mandate. I had two mandates in my first year. First one was building out the tech vertical marketplace, which honestly is more glamorous sounding, but it's easier for me, right? Given my own background. Right. The other one is harder. <laughs> um, <laughs> Offline new product development, uh, R and D, commercialization, getting out onto the market, getting market feedback, uh, getting it iterating, then scaling it is so hard. Um, and in many ways, I might ways... have had one of your products, uh, by the way. Um, when I was, I mean, you saw me, uh, November twenty twenty one, and yes. you, you'd you'd come for my thing, and um, then I'd gone to Goa with a couple of friends. Yeah. Um, there one morning I had maybe was it a cookie or one of these things yeah. Yeah, the thingy that you just saw and in Goa like you know there were a bunch of snacks but in a was it a cafe coffee day one of yours yeah. and I looked at uh, the friends that I was with and said you know this is uh, Abhilashas so that yeah. was a very proud moment of uh, your product that I had and it was really really well done if that's your job i don't know how you learned that or where you learned all of that but it was uh, very well executed i'd say so it's also about dots connecting backwards uh, one i have a degree in mechanical engineering so i've never practiced it but i actually understand supply chains very well uh two my first internship in life was with itc foods um oh, wow. literally yeah. the biscuits division sun feast <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I think like I had never thought these dots will connect. Um, and I think weirdly enough, because I had worked in uh, cutting edge science before, I understood the whole journey of uh, R&D and then commercialization. Very different markets. I mean, literally one you're talking about, like, you know, clients at Elucidata being, you know, people who are discovering new drugs. Mm. And here it's like, how do we now produce a new sort of like um, brownie which meets these kind of constraints? But there are similarities. So weirdly enough, that part was the le less glamorous, much harder part. And the three things that helped me were my background in mechanical engineering. I understood like supply chain, assembly line, blah, blah, blah. Uh, number two was literally my experience understanding that whole transition of R&D to, um, you know, commercialization, because we had to make many decisions. We had like many projects in the R&D pipeline. Which one do you kill? Which one do you move forward? Um, which one has market, you know, uh, possibilities? Um, and the third really over there was um, just the fact that I have seen I my first job in my life had been with ITC Foods on their shop floor so i really or understood in the biscuit it. division so life really yeah. comes together yeah it does hey, Abhilata, uh, yeah this is this i know you really take personal ownership in anything you're involved with whether you're investing whether you're building but uh, with uh, with open secret you i think we're working with a friend we recently yes. had heidi rosen you you may yes. have heard of her she's yes. one of the most well-known VCs and yeah. most networked person one can imagine. And she sometimes, she discussed the difficulty of working with somebody you care, you, you care a lot, a lot yeah. about. Um, what advice do you have uh, from that perspective? Is it all fun and games because you're working with a friend or a family member, somebody you care about, or is it, you know, something to avoid? Uh, interestingly, every alternate gig of mine has involved working with a friend. Uh, hmm. so my first job after IIT was at Avanti uh, Learning Centers, which was a nonprofit education, the, got, like phenomenal work in the education skills system space. I had been a student volunteer uh, with them in my IIT days. So when I joined Avanti as, and as when they incorporated, I had known the founders, Aksha and Krishna, um, 
for two, three years. And they were like mentors, friends. Um, then my stint at Elucidata, the co-founder CTO was my friend from IIT, uh, right? <laughs> so, you know, like that's the reason they even, we started working together. Otherwise, how does a Harvard MBA suddenly start working in like this biotech space? And of course, Ahana is somebody who I had um, sort of, um, you know, known, been friendly with, and now we've grown to be really close friends. Um, so here's my take. And I actually am like going to go and uh, see that Heidi Rosen stuff that you've been doing because I really admired her. Um, oh, you, you will, you know, because she actually, um, her brother and she started the company and then she, she became oh. the CEO and then they saw very different directions of the company. They are now still very close, but they eventually went separate ways. So you'll enjoy her mental models. Yeah, I think there was a case at Harvard on her, which is why I yes. remember her. And it really resonated with me because I was somebody at that stage and just small digression who was like, I can never network. Because if you meet me in a social setting, I usually will, I'm an introvert very talkative but I'm an introvert I don't like talking right. to 15 people at an event I will talk to like three people in a lot of depth in an event but over the years I've realized that I've become a great networker and a lot of my mental models around networking eventually came from that case I'd read on Heidi Rosen um, but yeah I think stepping back more um, you know on your question it's it can be the best of things and it can be the worst of things. Uh, it can be the best of things because there is implicit trust, there is camaraderie, there's a shared history. But if you're not intentional about the fact that, hey, we aren't friends in this capacity, we are co-workers, or in fact, there's also often a power dynamic. I have no illusions that Ahana is my boss or was my boss. Uh, you know, she is the founder CEO, she's my boss. Uh, and, you know, we can sort of, as colleagues, uh, agree, disagree, but eventually, you know, the final call is hers on a matter. By the way, I've also way back at Avanti hired one of my childhood friends to report into mm -hmm. me. And, you know, we had this relationship where I was like, yes, we can be friends in these, these, these zones. You can argue as much as you like for on these mm. parameters, but the final decision on ABC is mine because I'm your boss or I run this function. So, and I think I'm giving these anecdotes because uh, these are what can make a relation, you know, working relationship with a prior personal history useful. One is definition of roles. We can't be unclear about what is the roles? What are the norms? Who has more power? Who has more responsibility? Um, we can't be unclear about that. Uh, and I learned it the hard way, right? So I don't, you know, there's a whole different thing. I've, there have been a lot of like major issues um, in these setups. Uh, number two is uh, when you are working together, work together as colleagues. And hmm. when then you are socializing, work together, you know, or whatever in your personal context and go back to those roles. As an example, mm -hmm. um, you know, with sometimes we literally be like, hey, this is co-workers. We're going to do this. Now, by the way, we're going to go and have a drink after this. And now we are friends. And the norms yeah. and boundaries are very different. But it's very intentional, right? Like we're both communicating and saying that this is who we are in this role. Um, Third is just um, recognize, recognition of the pitfalls, right? Colleagues often disappoint each other, right? And that's true in any relationship. Having right. said that, if you have a personal relationship, you get even more emotionally like, how could you do this to me? How can I, you know, it's because there are multiple layers. You have to be very mature about separating that out. Because you can't take the other person for granted or you know people think that the big risk is that you will favor your friend no that's not the big risk the big risk is that when you work with them you'll take them for granted you'll sort of think you can get away with saying something to them that you would not get away with saying to anybody else 
Um, so most mature people I know, or at least in my case, I don't think the risk has ever been favoritism. I think the risk has mm. been anti-favoritism. Um, <laughs> so it's so I think it is very, very, you know, possible. But with two mature individuals who are able to create separations, have very good boundaries, be very communicative in nature. Otherwise, it's like <laughs> it's right for disaster. I mean, Asha, we've covered so much ground today. Um, we should do this another follow up once you're back from Kashmir and you're done with yes. the writing uh, tour, because there is so much to synthesize from the first podcast that we did and today's discussion, which is a lot more deep and uh, goes into many open questions. So thank you for laying it out. Is there anything that I should have asked you that I didn't before we open it up for audience questions? Um or anything that you parting words of advice or just like any thoughts that you may have? Uh, I mean, just one thing, which is like, whatever scares you the most is probably going to drive the most growth. Uh, so before I decided to jump into the sabbatical, I, I, I didn't jump in. I walked into the sabbatical very intentionally. It scared the hell out of me uh, because it was very different from anything I had done. But part of me knew that this wasn't the bad kind of fear. It was the kind, good kind of fear, which was like, hey, this is going to be unusual. But if I'm willing to sort of, you know, play along, learn as I grow, go, this is probably going to be the one of the best things I do. Um, so yeah. I, I would just say that, right? Like just uh, most humans, if once they get better at reflection, know when it's good fear and when it's bad fear. Um, yeah. And when it's good fear, just fear that, you know, you really want to do it, but it makes you feel uncomfortable because it seems challenging, go for it. Um, because uh, worst case, even if you feel like, you know, you become a better person um, in that process. So very philosophical Wednesday evening music. As it should be. And, you know, I, I mean it. We'll do a, another one once you, once you have time uh, later next month. So here's the way to make sense of Abhilasha's uh, masterclass here on Network Capital. Step one would be to listen to the previous episode where we talk about her early journey, what she did at IIT, at Harvard Business School, how she thought about uh, some of the pivotal career decisions. Then come to this one and start from the beginning. So with the basic context set, you'll be able to see how career transitions take place, how diversity of thought processes uh, shape people, how different decisions are taken. Should you work with a friend? How should you work with a friend? Um, how do you take unknown decisions with unknown unknowns? How do you make sense when everything is you know, up in the air? What are the ways to do active reflection? How to not reflect as a very sad person uh, in a muddled about way? So we've covered a lot, but don't forget to listen to the first part uh, especially if you're applying to business school and so forth. And if you're looking for a career transition, you could start from the second part directly, but it'll, you know, it'll be perhaps a little more helpful uh, with this. Abhilasha, it's always a treat uh, to have you Hi. here and I can't wait to have you back soon. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure to subscribe to Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll apprise you of the next episode and make you part of our community. Thank you very much.